Allow me to begin by talking about what has been described as the lifelong quest of man. Lifelong quest of man is to see God. Amen. Even the mighty Moses wanted to see God. In Exodus chapter 33, and verse 18 and verse 20, you see a conversation that took place between Moses and his creator. Moses said to the Lord in verse 18 of Exodus 33, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Show me your weight. Show me your majesty. Show me, the, the Hebrew word is kavad. Show me your glory. That is, show me your face. God's response to Moses in verse 20, it says, And he, God, said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. Isn't that amazing? And if you, uh, 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 at your leisure, study the conversation, it's amazing the wonderful things that God did promise Moses that he would show him. He promised that he would show Moses. He says, I'll allow my compassion to pass before you. In verse 19, he says, I'll show you my goodness. I'll proclaim my name before you. I'll let you see my graciousness. And I will show mercy upon whom I will show mercy. Four major things. He says, but my face, you can't see that. Because if you see my face, you'll die. And, and the Lord didn't say that to protect his amenity. But the Lord said this because he knew that no matter how awesome human beings are, because you got to remember, he made us. He knows that there are certain sights that a human being, that man in his fallen nature cannot bear to look upon and live. That, that there is something that if a human being sees, it would cause that human being to drop dead. Isn't that something? Uh, uh, the mortician has a trained eye. You don't want to take a person who doesn't have the trained eye of a mortician and take them uh, into a mortuary and allow them to see with an untrained eye what a mortician does to a deceased, to a dead body. The first responders have, tra have a trained eye. They can go to a... a, a an act, the scene of an accident and see the human body all but torn apart and remove that person from the car and deal with all of the things that we who have the untrained eye have never seen and then go and have lunch and sleep and rest well after a certain period of time because they have a trained eye. Praise the Lord. No human being has a trained eye to look upon the creator of the universe. In fact, we're told that the only way we'll be able to see him as he is and it not kill us is after we've been changed. Then the Bible says we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. So the Lord wasn't trying to hide. He was uh, having mercy on Moses. He said, but I tell you what I will do. I'll, I'll put you in the cleft of the rock and I'll put my hand before you as I walk past you and you can see my back. But if you look at my face, you won't be able to live. 
What a mighty God. William Dorling, in his book, The Invisible God, said this concerning this subject. If you have studied philosophy, you will notice that most philosophers are hesitant to deny the necessity for the existence of the infinite. Most philosophers know that there is, that there is an almighty, all-knowing, everlasting, unlimited, infinite being. And most scientists are ready to concede that man is finite. Humans are limited. So man can't be God because we have too many limitations. This is why no human being should leave God for another human being. For no matter how wonderful a human being may be, they're still a human being. And human beings have limits. He can be the most handsome, coolest brother ever, sister girl. But don't leave Jesus for him. Because he's a handsome, cool brother. He's not a God. So therefore, therefore, he is limited in what he can do. Amen. And in how far he will go. And no matter how wonderful his appearance may be, uh, don't get too carried away uh, about it because he won't keep it. No one does. The grass, the Bible says, declare that all flesh is grass. And the grass withereth. And the flower fadeth. Am I right about that? Amen. Amen. So, uh, uh, but our God remains the same. Same thing with the sister. She may be the prettiest woman in the world, but she's a woman. She has limitations. On this, both the scientists and the philosophers, in most cases, agree. If man were the creator of his own universe, he would continue to have and manifest at least some of his original creative powers. But man has never been able to create anything. Man has never been able to create something from nothing. At our best, man is good at manipulating raw materials already in existence. We didn't reach into nothing and come up with the material to make the cell phone. We didn't reach out into nothing and come up with the materials necessary to create a computer, to make the computer. Medical breakthroughs aren't breakthroughs that uh, come from uh, chemicals and things and substances, uh, substance that man reached into nothing and created. But man used the raw materials that the, crea the creator put in the earth long ago to figure out how to make that asthma medicine, that medicine to, to treat high blood pressure, so forth and so on. Thank God for the technology of man, but man is only good at manipulating the raw materials that God put in the earth in the first place. To see God has been the ultimate aim of all true Philosophy, it is the ultimate hope of all science. You know, to see God, man wants to be equal with God. You see the never-ending battle of humans trying to outdo and outwit the creator. And it will remain the ultimate desire of all nations. But God cannot be found this way anywhere in the wide realms of nature, in the great and wonderful world which we see and touch. Science proclaims that no God can be found on the pathway she has explored. And they're right. You can't find God using scientific methods. Science have employed the telescope. And she has surveyed the heavens. And the scientists have looked 
at the sun and looked at the stars and they've looked as far as giant telescopes can look into outer space and yet they haven't found God. On the other hand, the scientists have employed the microscope and looked uh, at all of the miniature uh, astonishing life forms and all of the bacteria and things that you would uh, that you can pick up in your hand. There is there is more bacterium and things in the dirt that you can pick up with your hand that man hadn't figured out what to do with. Then we figured out uh, what to do to uh, come up with uses of, and yet in the microscope we still can't find God. Are you with me? No matter how close we examine these things, scientists have said God is not there. Amen. He is not in the stars of the sky. He is not in the grains of sand. He is not in the flowers gemmed with dew nor in the marvelous processes of life which form the basis of our own physical being. He is far beyond. He is far away, praise the Lord, than those things. And so when we look far away, we say that he's not there. When we look close up, we say that he cannot be found. And yet in this sixth beatitude, Jesus promised us something that the microscope nor the telescope can deliver. He promises something that no human philosophy can deliver, that no man-made doctrine can deliver. Jesus promised us the ability to see God. Isn't that something? What a promise, what a claim. Finite man has been provi provided a way to see the infinite, almighty creator of the universe, the creator of infinity, the creator of time, the creator of eternity, and everything else. God has provided a way for limited human beings to see him. Paul says this about our great God in uh, Acts of the Apostles, uh, chapter 17, while speaking to the Athenians uh, on Mars Hill, Paul says in verse 24, God that hath made the worlds and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth and dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with man's hands, hands, although he needed, I mean, as though he needed anything. See, the false gods have to be carried from one place to the other. They have to be washed. They have to be repainted. When the jewels fall out of the statues, they, the jewels have to be put, put back. All kinds of maintenance crews have to be in place to keep the false gods shiny and pristine. And yet our God needs none of these things. Do you not know at first they called the Christians atheists because the Christian God was not a God who could be depicted by some statue. Christians did not uh, go to, uh, as the, uh, the worldly people did, and the, the heathens, as they worshiped Asclepos, the, 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 the snake God and uh, God of medicine and they, they, they worshipped uh, Zeus and all these other gods, uh, Astaroth and all of the gods who had statues, the, the Caesars, the, the pantheon of gods of Rome. Well, the Christian God was not a God that had a statue that you could, where you could bow at his feet. So then they called us atheists because there was no statue that needed maintenance. My God, I'm glad that we serve a God who doesn't need us to have us to bathe him. Hallelujah. I'm glad that we serve a God whose diamonds don't have to be 
put back into the eye sockets of the statue uh, that, uh, because they fell out due to the corrosion of the weather. Isn't that something? We serve the true and living God who needs nothing as though he needeth anything. Seeing, look at this, instead of us uh, 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 giving maintenance to him, Paul says, seeing he giveth to all life and, and breath and all things. He gives to us and hath made of us one blood. Praise the Lord. There is no master race. God made of us. He made us from one blood. All nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth and have determined the times before appointed. That is, he has determined how long they will uh, uh, exist. And look at this. The bounds of their habitation. Boundaries. Praise the Lord. Uh, God determined even those things. That they should seek the Lord. The human race. Given the bounds of their habitation. That all people should seek the Lord. If haply they might feel after him. And look at this. Look at how fair God is. You know, we say, well, what about these countries where they've never heard of the Lord? Look at this. That and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. The Lord has presented himself to everybody. From one way or another, God has. If man would just seek after him, man can find him. Look at this. For in him we live and move and have our being as certain also of your own poets have said for we are his offspring what a mighty god we serve he he made everything he made the earth and everything in it amen john said this on the subject of seeing god he said in John 1 and 18, no man have seen God at any time. The only begotten son, which is in the bosom of the father, he hath declared him. No man have seen God the father at any time. Also in 1 John chapter 4, verse 12, the A clause says, no man have seen God at any time. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 16 says, Who only, speaking of God, hath immortality, d dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. The fact that God cannot be seen by our physical eyes is not a recent discovery. Jesus said this about God the Father. Hear me well. He said, uh, John uh, chapter 4 and verse 24, God, speaking of God in his truest essence, in his basic existence, in his most fundamental existence, God is a spirit. God is a spirit. That you can't see him. It is explained. He is a spirit. Now, I'm not speaking of a vision of God. Or a manifestation of God. Or even God incarnate, which was Jesus Christ. But God in his basic essence is invisible to the human eye. And no matter how the scientists and the philosophers, no matter how powerful they build their microscopes and their telescopes and all of their discoveries, they will never be able to find God through these things. He cannot be seen by the human eye. The Bible long ago declared what scientists is now finding out. That it cannot discover those things that are known 
only through revelation. Until and unless God decides to reveal himself, man cannot find him. The Bible nowhere intimates that a mere scientific search, search for God is suitable or likely to succeed. And you know, when these people fail, you know what they declare? They declare there is no God. Since we can't find him, he doesn't exist. Since our instruments can't detect him, well, that, that means he, he's not detectable. No, it means you can't detect him. That's all it means. It means that finite man, there are, there are things that are beyond our finite, our limited abilities. See, it's easy for us to write off as a human race that which we cannot explain and that which we cannot attain to. Don't, you, don't let anybody fool you. Our God is real. Are you with me today? I'll, I'll, I'll preach in, in just a few minutes, but, but, you, but he has to reveal himself. Job said this about God. Job testified. He bore this testimony, and he said, Oh, uh, that I knew where I might find him. You remember that, Job chapter 23. Job said, Oh, that I could find him. Uh, uh, isn't that powerful? That I might come even to his seat. He said, if I could find him, I would go to his throne. This is Job 23 and verse 3. The eighth verse says, says this. Job says, behold, I go forward, but he is not there. And backwards, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand, where doth he work? On the left hand, I cannot behold him. I can't see him. He hideth himself on the right hand. I cannot see him. But he knows the way that I take. And when he have tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Job said, even though I can't find him, he knows me. And when I am tried, Job says, I'll come forth as pure gold. But, but when God got ready, he revealed himself to Job. But make no mistake about it, Job didn't see God as he is. For if Job saw the Father in his splendor as he is, Job would have dropped dead. Concerning seeing God, there was a conversation between Rabbi Joshua and the Roman Emperor Trajan. And Trajan uh, told uh, Rabbi Joshua, he says, your God, being sarcastic, your God is everywhere. I'd like to see him. The rabbi responded by saying, no mortal eye uh, can behold his glory. He says, uh, but I tell you what, the rabbi being filled with wisdom, let us go and view one of his ambassadors. Yes, sir. I can't show you him, but I'll show you one of his ambassadors. Yes, the emperor agreed. So the emperor and the rabbi went out into the court at noonday. Yeah. And the rabbi said, look up at the sun and just gaze at the sun. Yes, the emperor said, I can't gaze uh, in, in the sun because the light of the sun dazzles me. It's, it's too much. It's too bright. The rabbi said, now you want to see him. But you can't bear to look at one of his, create, his creatures. If you can't look at his creatures, you know you're not able to look at him. What a mighty God we serve. Yet having said all of this, this sixth beatitude, the sixth beatitude, is very clear that a certain group of people, a certain group, not everybody, not a, not a group of people distinguished by race or gender, praise the Lord, but they are distinguished. Amen. They, they're distinguished. I can't say race, gender, or religion. Hey, or, or who you have sex with. No, religion and who you have sex with distinguishes. 
because there's a certain group of people uh, who uh, are promised that they can see God and these group of people are pure of heart. And your religion has something to do with whether or not you can get your heart pure. And your sex life has something to do with whether or not your heart is pure. I can't get any help in here. I, I, uh, I must be preaching to a, a bunch of uh, praise the Lord. All right. I'm, now li listen to this. Jesus said, blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. The word heart there, uh, the Greek word is cardia. It gives us the English cardia or cardiac. And when you have a heart attack, it's, it's a cardiac arrest. It, heart problems are problems with the cardia. Used here metaphorically to represent the inner person. Heart, the inner person, it's metaphorical. It's, it's it, the, the deceit of motives. Our attitude, the seat of personality. Our thinking process. The will. See, blessed are the pure of heart. The Bible says in Proverbs 4 and 23, keep thine heart. Listen to this, with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Our thoughts, our, our motives, the things that occupy our mind comes from our heart. And it is important for every believer to guard their heart, to keep it pure. Praise the Lord. This is why we have to be careful as to our choices in entertainment. Careful as to our choices in, in the company that we keep, the people we associate with, the music that we listen to, the messages that we allow to be forced and reinforced in our spirits, the things that we allow to, uh, uh, to get through our eye gate. You got to be careful to keep your heart because out of your heart, flow the issues of life. You can't live a clean life constantly feeding your heart dirt. A man can't claim to have a pure heart given to pornography. For pornography will mess up your mind. The images stay there. They stay there, and, and, and that speaks to your heart. Yes, so right. Praise the Lord. I hate hip-hop music Amen. with a perfect hatred. <laughs> and my hatred is not just the beat. I can't say rhythm because most of it is rhythmless. It, 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 the strength of it is the, the, the drum. We... Black folk are a people of the drum. They understand the, the role that the beat, the repetitiveness plays on your subconscious. That repetitive beat gets through. It gets through the, 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 uh, the walls in the mind, the gate. Boom, boom, boom. You see people sometimes driving in cars, the whole car shaking. I was somewhere the other day, I couldn't hear my radio. Looked over, there's a brother, boom, boom. I'm like, man, you're gonna go death. But I said, but I'm not gonna say anything to you. They had too much road rage out now, you know. <laughs> you speak to a person now, they pull out a gun and shoot you. What'd you say? Turn that radio down, pow. All right, so, uh, but, but, but listen, it's the message. Oh, the, the constant dropping of the F-bombs, the reinforced messages, hate law enforcement, hate the police, shoot this person, shoot that person, calling our girls bees and calling our women whores and all just uh, uh, messages filled with misogyny and degrading messages and you can't tell me that you can listen to that stuff over and over and over and over and it not affect you. Some people fall asleep listening to that stuff. Now you have no filter. You have, you, you don't even, 
you don't even resist because you are your resistance. You are in ram sleep, and Satan has a open door, a open door with no filter to just deposit trash in your spirit. And you wonder why little Johnny is so mad. What happened to our daughter? This is not the girl we gave birth to. Now she's, she talks back. She's this, she's that. Her, her attitude is that of resistance. It's, it's in what's being fed to them. It's reality television, which is not reality. It's not reality. It's not reality. They have a script. It's not reality. And they all, they're always pushing the wrong stuff to us to make us rebel and make you angry and put a chip on your shoulder. Set you up for a wonderful, perfectly fitted uh, orange suit. Next thing you know, you go from being whatever your name is to uh, a three, four, five, six, seven. That's right. Where did it come from? What was fed? What was fed? What was fed? What was fed to you? Praise the Lord. You, Pastor, I'm struggling with living holy. Okay, I'm just struggling. I'm, I'm single and I'm struggling. Okay, well, uh, I'm... Before we go to the deep things and cast out demons and devils, imagine this. Uh, what do you watch on television? What are your favorite shows? Praise the Lord. What, what kind of music are you listening to? What are the lyrics filled with? Are you, are you listening to uh, a Soon and Very Soon or Love Won't Let Me Wait? I mean, what, what, are, what are you listening to? It has, it has an effect on your heart. Thank you, Jesus, the heart. We want, we want to make sure our young people are, are, are reinforced with, with, with messages. Parents don't fuss all the time. Love them and reinforce them with messages uh, that, that, that makes them feel good about who they are. Talk to that little boy like he's a boy. Ain't no gender neutral talk to no boy. Talk to that boy like he's a boy. You talk to the little girl like she's a girl. Amen. You encourage boyishness in the little rascal. And sometimes, sometimes you, you got to just understand when he, uh, now you got to keep discipline. Now, I'm a disciplinarian. But there are times when you got to understand that what you're seeing is just boyish behavior. And you don't want to break his spirit. Y'all hey, turn that mic off. Huh? I'm, I, yeah, that microphone is hot. I hope you all been saying amen. Yes, sir. Because if you hadn't, if, they, if you hadn't, they, they, they taped you. Amen. I sure hope you hadn't ruined the broadcast. It's a good sermon. Amen. Uh, but anyway, the, the, the little girl, you know, dress up like a girl. Target, Target got it wrong. Trying to have a gender neutral section and Oh, and, and ladies, anytime they go gender neutral, you know who suffers? You know what fashion suffers? The fashion for women. Because they take all the pretty colors away. Take all the daintiness away. Next thing you know, there you are dressed in drab, 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 drab. You're just drab and ugly. You're drab because it's, it's gender neutral. God have given you license, women, to be beautiful and dainty and colorful. And, 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 and all those things that make a woman special. But what makes the woman special is not what makes the man special. Praise the Lord. It's, it's just the opposite for the brother. You don't hear what I'm saying. Be careful what you feed your heart. When I finished preaching up in uh, South Bend on my way out the door, I stopped to a young man. I had saw him earlier on my way in. The Holy Spirit said, Get, talk to him before you leave. And I, on my way out the door, I just preached. I'm, I'm on my way back to change clothes, being rocking. We got to go. We're going back to Raleigh, praise the Lord. We got to get us a couple hours of sleep, get up and catch the flight. And I got to go, but I walked up to that young man. And I said, brother, you the guy I saw on the outside, aren't you? He said, yes, sir. I said, listen, don't let nobody make you a sissy. Don't let nobody turn you out. 
You a man, you be a man, you stand your ground. As a man, I wasn't on the microphone, I wasn't on the mic. You don't know him, so, and I, I reached out to shake his hand, and let me tell you what blessed me. When I grabbed his hand, oh, this, this, this young boy, he, he's full of strength. Mm, I was impressed with the resistance of his handshake. See, men talk by shaking hands. Men don't give each other a fish. Oh, no. Look, all respect is lost. All respect is lost. Because you know what we do? We have big conversations. Right there. That's right. That's big right. conversation. That's right. Just That's right, right there. Right. Uh, I, he'd have told me so many wonderful things about him. That's right. And, and, and among the things, whether or not I should even respect him. That's right. Whether or not he's worthy of a conversation. Say amen. amen. I got to get back to the text. But uh, 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 when I finished talking with the young man, even the ladies who were standing around, they, they began to say amen. Talk to him, Bishop. And his daddy came up to me after service, and he said, that was my son you was talking to. And I said, well, good. But well, let me tell you what I told him. He was of age, so I would, had he been a little boy, I wouldn't have. Well, he was grown, man. I told him what I, what I shared, and his dad thanked me. He thanked me. See, it's, it's what we feed people. It's what we reinforce. What we reinforce. Some, some professor, some clown the other day was, was at, at one of the universities was telling black kids that, that math and science and numbers are racist. Now, th 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 that's what's being told to black students. But uh, Asian students and, and Indian students and foreign students who are coming into the country to get an education, they are being told the glory of numbers. The glory of math, the glory of science, the glory of these things. So they get filled with it and make A's and all the good grades in these things. We think it's racist, so therefore. Let me do it right. Set up straight. Don't even, don't even set up straight. That's right. So then both students graduate. That's right. The business community looks for workers. Right. One man ends up, which one do you think ends up with the corporate job making all the money? Right. Versus the other with a college degree asking you at McDonald's, do you want me to supersize that or not? After you order a number three, <laughs> I like a number three <laughs> with cheese. Would you like for me to supersize that? That means you missed it. You, the wrong things were fed to you in, at an early age. Now, when I preach this stuff, you know, some people get mad, but I'd rather tell you the truth. I'd rather tell you the truth. I would rather tell you the truth. And I want to tell you, young people, early, learn something. You know, go to school, go to school, but don't just go to school. Major in something that, you know, that, 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 that can pay you. Amen. Well, you want to have a worthwhile degree. Oh, there go wooden again. That, there go wooden. There go wooden. You are right. Because I love the people of God and nothing helps people like the truth. With all that getting, get and understand. All right, let me, let, me, let me close this out because you don't like my preaching today. But keep your heart with all diligence for out of it flows the issues of life. Proverbs says, for as a man thinketh, Proverbs 23, 7 a, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he, regardless of what he thinks. Regardless, excuse me, of what he says, it's how he thinks. This is why I preach the way that I do, to, to, to help foster a certain mindset. A certain mindset because you are your thoughts. You are how you think. You are your mindset. And if you have the mindset of a loser, you're going to lose. You'll figure out a way to mess it up. Or you'll be right at the finish line. All you have to do is just step across the line and you'll stop. And wait 40 minutes for everybody to catch up with you and let them beat you.
Think of the people who've just messed up good things in their life. Just mess up. Good family. Good job. Good career. Good money. Good. Everything's good. But if you have, after a while, that loser says, something must be wrong. <laughs> Something's got to be wrong. Why? Because it's going so good. Loser's mentality. I got to, they won't say it, I got to mess this up. I've got to somehow find a way to sabotage my life. And you know what they do? They mess it up. Get all the way to the NFL and can't stop smoking marijuana. Smoke, smoking dope at the combine. combine. Now they, they, they done told you before you get there, we're going to test you. See that door? That's the testing door. You're right around the corner. <laughs> Got that. I mean, you're de- bound and determined to mess it up. Company said, now we want you to hide. We want you to come, time, come on time, do this, do that. We want you to look a certain kind of way. And oh, for a minute, you do it. But then, here you go. I got to be me. I'm who I am. I don't care what none of these folks say. I got to do it my way. Next thing you know, you don't have a job. I shouldn't say it. But wouldn't it have been good during the summer months to see the NFL players in the communities trying to do something about all this stuff they've been protesting about? Are oh, you going to take a knee? Why didn't you get off your knees come during the off season and come on out in the community? Praise the Lord and, and help out and do some things. No, you know what we fall for today? We fall for symbolism over substance. We like stuff that look like there's something, uh, uh, regardless of whether there's something to it or not. Oh, I got to go. I got to go. I, I listen, I get caught in this. So it is the will of God. It is the will of God to, for us to be careful how we think. Our heart uh, deal with our thoughts and our will and our motives, the inner person. And he says, blessed are the pure of heart. Pure, uh, pure of heart comes from a a Greek word that give us uh, the the, the English word catharsis. Basic meaning is to make clean. To make clean from dirt, from filth, and from contamination. Catharsis is a term in psychology and counseling for the cleansing of the mind and the emotions. One of the reasons why they let you talk is that they feel that as you talk it out, you cleanse yourself of these things. It's related to a Latin word that gives us the word chase. It is the will of God to chasten, to clean up our heart, to clean up our minds. It's like metal of being uh, uh, refined and getting all the purities taken out. It is the will of God for our hearts to be pure. When applied to the heart, the idea is that of pure motives, single-mindedness, undivided devotion, spiritual integrity, and true righteousness. Can I say it again? When applied to the heart, the idea is that of serving God and living life with pure motives. Single-mindedness. I'm not a Christian with an Islamic flair. I don't mix a little Buddha with my Jesus. I don't mix a little connect uh, these uh, woke stuff and all these crazy things. I'm not a five percenter, a one percenter, or I'm a Christian. I have a single-minded pursuit of the God of the Bible. I believe that the Bible is God's only written infallible word. It is God's love letter to mankind. I view it, there is no book on equal par with the Bible. When the Bible looks right and the Bible looks left, the Bible sees nobody because nothing is equal to the word of God. And thank God for living in a country where the Constitution still allows us the freedom to serve the God of the Bible with all of our heart and soul. Ah, 
Praise the Lord. David said to the Lord, create in me. Psalm 51 and 10, a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. And I want you to know purity of heart is beyond sincerity of heart because there are people who are sincere. But brother, sorry, they're sincerely wrong. The Iman is sincere. The, the, the people who call 9-11, they kill themselves, right? They had to be sincere to get on a plane and fly the plane into a building knowing that they were going to get killed. They were sincere, but they were sincerely wrong. It takes more than just being sincere. You've got to be holy. You've got to be right. Are you with me? Oh, a man cannot serve God properly without a pure heart. Even when you do good things, if you do good things with impure motives, you're still not pure of heart. I like what Thomas Watson said. Thomas Watson said, Mort morality can drown a man as fast as a vice. A vessel may sink whether it is filled with gold or with dung. Either way, the weight can sink the vessel. Some of us are moral, but we're self-righteous. And no, we don't drink. We don't fornicate. We don't cuss. We don't dip and we don't chew. But we're filled with jealousy, envy, strife. We're, we're churchgoers, but we're unforgiving. Yes, sir, you couldn't, you couldn't catch us uh, at a whorehouse uh, if we were dead. But! Uh, we, 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 we are as mean as a rattlesnake. Let me tell you, everybody needs to ask God to purify their hearts. Let, let's, let's get ready to leave here, Rocky. But when you deal with man's standard of purity, one man said a good man looks down on the person that is not as good as himself. And then that person looks down on someone who seems to be a little less than himself. And then that person looks down on someone less good than himself. Eventually you get down to the most rotten person in society, the worst person on earth. And that last person, the worst person is the standard by which all persons are judged. So we feel, feel cleaner uh, than the most rotten among us. We feel like we're all right because after all, I'm living better than that person. I feel that I'm doing good because I'm not as immoral as this individual. That's man's standard of purity. But God's standard of purity is different from man. We find God's standard in the same Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5 and 48, God says, Be you therefore, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. God's standard for purity is God himself. So with the standard being as high as it is, we don't have time to be looking at someone else. We've got to spend time working on ourselves. We got to pray every day. Create in me, O oh God, a clean heart and renew a right spirit in me. Oh, I'm glad that I'm not at the club. I'm glad that I'm not at the crack house. I'm glad that I'm not at the whorehouse. Oh, but those are low standards. I still need to be the person that the Lord would have me to be. And when I look at myself, I have to admit I see, Brother Johnson, that I still need to work a little harder. I need to work on me a little bit more because I want to understand who God is. I want to see him. Can I get a witness? Psalms 24 speaks of pure hands, clean hands and a pure heart. Isaiah 59, one through four says, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he can't save, neither is his ear heavy that he can't hear, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have caused him to hide his face from you. If you haven't seen God move lately, it's not that the Lord have gone out of business. It's not that God is no more able. It's not that the God of the Bible is not strong. Perhaps we need to take a look at ourselves. Perhaps we need to examine our own hearts and say, Lord, take out 
everything that's not right because I want to be who and what you'd have me to be. There are two basic kinds of religions in the world. There's the religion of human achievement and there's the religion of divine accomplishment. All religions other than biblical Christianity falls in the first category. They're religions of human achievement. But when you become a Christian, it's not what we've done, it's what Jesus did. It's the religion of divine accomplishment. For God sent his son into the world to die for your sins and mine and to make us pure. Somebody lift your hands and say, Lord, purify me. Now let me preach just a few more minutes and I'll be done. Good God Almighty, biblical Christianity teaches us to lean on Jesus. And in the Bible, there are six kinds of purity. Purity number one is primal purity. That's the purity that exists only in God. God is just pure. And in him, there's no impurity at all. And then there was created purity. That was the earth and the universe before the fall. And then there is such a thing as positional purity. That's the purity that we get the moment we get saved. The smell of liquor can still be on our breath. The stench of sin can still be on us. But the moment you get saved, you are positionally made pure. There is imputed purity. God grants purity to the new nature of the believer. Once you get saved, all of a sudden you begin to want to be pure. And then there is the fifth one, is practical purity. This is the hands-on purity. It requires supreme effort on our part. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 7 and 1, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And the sixth purity is uh, uh, ultimate purity, heavenly purity. Paul says, then shall we see him as he is. But let me talk about this practical purity because that's the purity that Jesus is preaching about. That practical purity is purity that causes us to work on ourselves. It's the purity that causes us to take a good look at ourselves. See, you're not saying amen now. It causes us to, to see those areas where we need to come up. God has saved us. The Lord has set us free, but there are still things that we need to work on. Hallelujah. We are not saved just for the future heavenly purity, but we are saved for the present earthly purity. And when we work on ourselves, living right here on this earth, it makes us a witness for the Lord. God never demands that which he has not provided a way for us to do. We can be practically pure. We must first realize that we can't live it without Jesus Christ. So we got to cry out and say, Lord, help me. We must stay in God's word. Saints of God, if you want to be pure, read your Bible. Read the word. Keep it before you. Every night and every day, we need to be filled and led by the Holy Ghost. If you haven't been filled, you need to seek the Lord and say, God, fill me with the Holy Ghost. I want to live right, but I can't live it on my own. I need the power of God, the Holy Spirit, operating on the inside. And the fourth thing is, we need to pray, pray, pray. I heard the songwriter say, whisper a prayer in the morning.
coming. Whisper a prayer at noon. Whisper a prayer in the evening and it will keep your heart in tune. I wish I had some folk who would get excited about the prospect of praying. Pray until the vice goes away. Pray until that craving goes away. Pray until you get power. Pray until God anoints you. Ah, oh, we got to pray. Pray. Somebody lift your hand and praise the Lord. that person next to you how's your prayer life how's your prayer life how much time do you spend in prayer with God most Christians don't pray five minutes a day we're, we're, we're losing out the devil is gaining ground because we won't pray but you got to pray you have to discipline yourself turn the television off leave the cell phone in another room Take the home phone off the, off the hook and get on your face and cry out to the Lord. And then once you prayed and you don't know what else to say, just lay there, just stay there, just listen, just spend some quiet time with God. I'll tell you something, when you begin to pray, you find that your strength comes. When you become a prayer warrior, you find that God gives you power to overcome the enemy. He changes, you don't hear me, but prayer changes your appetite. Prayer not only gives you power to do right when you would do wrong, but it gives you the desire to do what is right. You can pray till you pray yourself out of one category into another category. Yeah! Yeah! Yes! Oh Lord, in. and if we pray and we let the Lord purify our hearts, guess what? Now we qualify. Now we qualify to see God. Somebody lift their hands and tell him thank you. We qualify to see God. What does it mean here? Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. It literally means they will discern the true and living God through the Son, Jesus Christ. See, let me tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't, it's not talking about seeing God in the day of judgment because everybody is going to see God, whether you want to or not. The wicked, the liar, the devil, all are going to see God and they're going to be judged and condemned and thrown in the lake of fire. All liars are going to have to stand before God. Wizards, people of other religions, those who did not accept Jesus, everybody is going to see God. But what Jesus the Beatitudes deal with for his sake here on this earth. We need to know who God is. Which God? What God? We need to be confident in our knowledge of God. How can we be confident in our knowledge of God? We're confident in our knowledge of God as we see God the Father. Not as he is, but uh, we will someday, but while here on this earth, we see him through the person of Jesus Christ. The Hebrew writer says that Christ is the express image of God. If you want to see what God looks like, what God thinks, what God's positions are on matters, whether they are political, entertainment, you name it, uh, 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 marital, whatever, you know what you do? You study Jesus Christ. 
For Jesus Christ, said, the Bible says this about Christ, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word, Jesus Christ, was God. Bible says, just John chapter 1, Bible says, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. That is an, that is an eternal interdependence between God the Father and God the Son. Jesus says, I am, look at this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. He says, if you had known me, praise the Lord, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth, you know him and have seen him, he says to his disciples, because you've seen me. You've seen me. So anybody who tell you Jesus Christ is just a good man? They try to put Jesus Christ in categories. You know, we got Jesus, and then that was Muhammad, and then that was, oh no. No, 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 no. No, no, Jesus stands alone. Jesus stands alone. He stands alone. You, yeah. he, doesn't, he doesn't belong in the conversation with Socrates, Aristotle, and ph human philosophers. Jesus is God in the flesh. He is the exact image of God. Jesus said to, to Philip, have I been so long with you, yet thou hast not known me, Philip. He that hath seen me have seen my father also. So how do you say, show us the father? If you've seen me, all you need to know about the father is what you uh, need to know about me. And he says, I and my father, John 10 and 30, are one. We're one. What is the point? What, what's the point of this? If we're going to know Jesus, know him. Want to go deeper in our knowledge of him. Understand him. Understand his writings. Understand his teachings. Understand what he really meant. Understand the significance of his life. Death and resurrection. One of the requirements for understanding this to a, moral, to a moral certainty. Understanding it so that when you go through the challenges of life, you don't get thrown. We ain't got to find you because a disaster happened. Hadn't been to church in six months, and so we blamed the whole church. The church need to call and check on so and so. No, no, you need that. That is a knowledge of God that you can you can attain to. That even in the darkest moment, you still know who the Lord is. But, but, but to attain this level is going to cost you. What is it going to cost you? The filthiness of the heart from a practical standpoint. The things that we harbor, that we know that we should let go, those things block us from knowing and seeing God as revealed through Jesus Christ. It's like a... Um, a darker and darker lens. You could, you, could, you could see him so much clearer if you throw those things away that God says, get rid of. Oh, you could understand church and the things of God. You won't be so bewildered and so easily confused if you come out of some, the thing that the Lord is telling you to let go of. See, this thing, the practical purity, costs something. Amen. Go on back in that closet and find them cigarettes and throw them away. Go through the house, get that alcohol, get it out of your house. Cut this one off. Cut that one off. You're communicating with the wrong folk. Let that stuff go. And you know what, you know what God gives you in return? Clearer sight. Greater understanding. A greater knowledge of who he is. A greater appreciation for the things of God. You get to see him. You, you look at everything that's going on and you're not confused. After you've listened to all the talking heads, you don't, you don't go back and forth because you see what God is doing and you know what God is doing. What are we willing to pray? 
What price are we willing to pay to understand God better? To see the Lord. Blessed are the pure of heart. For they, they shall see God. They will discern God. They see what God is doing in the nation. They know what's of God and they know what's of the devil. Amen. They don't, they're, they're not easily confused. The Lord wants us to know him to the extent that we can know him while here. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That's not blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God in heaven someday. We already know that's the, that's the case. I mean, the Bible tells us that. But that's, this is dealing with down here. We used to sing, we don't sing it anymore. I think that's why I enjoyed Toledo, uh, 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 South Bend. So they weren't trying to be CCM or nothing. They were just old fat Church of God in Christ. Hand clapping, foot stomping, just coach. I, I, I was at home. I, I, I still haven't recovered. That's why, that's why I couldn't preach good to you today. But listen to this. Listen to this. The Lord wants us to be as the old songs were. I'm not doubting about the way. Walking in the light. Holiness is right. I'm not doubting about the way. In my walk with the Lord now, I talk to very few people who walk in that confidence. Very few of us are confident. Confident. Who know beyond a shadow of a doubt. He'll never leave me. He'll never forsake me. Even though I may be sick in my body, I won't turn to another. Even though things aren't going right now the way I want them to go, I'm not wondering, God, are you still up there? No, because we know him. We know him. And we remember what Jesus says. Jesus says, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. And, and, then, and then when he went back to heaven to go with the Father, he says, now I'm going to send you another comforter. Someone like me. Just like me, but different. I'll send you another comforter, equal to me in every way. Now, unlike me, I got to go to the Father. But this one that I send, he will abide with you forever. And when he gets in you, Jesus says, he will talk about me. Why about him? For the Father chose to reveal himself to mankind through the Son. This is why Jesus today is such a pariah. Even most politicians, when they finish their speeches now, when they bless the country, they'll say, God bless America. I'm waiting on one to say, God bless America in Jesus' name. Amen. In Jesus' name. I was, I was invited one time. I don't know if they changed it. But at the time, they wanted me to come and pray, you know, the opening session of, uh, sessions for the politicians. I was so excited. And then they asked me a question. I mean, I felt like I was somebody. They asked me to go down there and pray. I said, wow, I've arrived. <laughs> so they asked me, how do, you, how, how do you pray? I didn't know how to answer that. I mean, you just pray. <laughs> then I found out that they didn't want me to close the prayer in Jesus' name. They said, you can say in your name, but, you know, we don't want to offend anybody. I said, get somebody else. That's right. I'm not going to do my Lord like that. That name saved me. That name sanctified me. And there is no other name under the heavens given among men whereby we might be saved. The name of Jesus. I want to understand God better. I want to understand God better. I want to understand him better. 
I want to understand him better. I want to understand him better. I want to understand him better. I want to understand him better. I want to understand him better. Better. I want to see God. I want to discern what the Lord is doing. I want to discern. I want to see. In my life, preacher, in the world, in my relationships. I want to know where I stand. I want to see him better. And if practical purity is the price that I must pay, if I must give up this, that, or the other, even those pet vices that are kind of like, that agrees with you, for the knowledge of God, for a greater revelation, I'll let it go because I want to know him. If I'm talking to you, meet me at the altar.